importance of seed saving and the value of genetic diversity within so many different plants, whether we find them as to be maybe weeds or ornamental or edibles. And today we are here at the North Central Regional Plant Introduction Station, joined by Jeff Karstens, who is the horticulture team curator. And so Jeff, you work for the USDA here at the Agriculture Research Station, and one of your roles is to help preserve those genetic uh, the genetic diversity of a lot of horticulture crops. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what plants you're looking at? Um, well, we've, we've, like you said, we've been saving seeds for a very long time. Our, our station actually started back in 1948. Um, when, when we started, you know, we had a horticulture project, but a lot of it was focused on agronomic crops, such as corn, uh, sunflowers and carrots and, and, and melons. Uh -huh. uh, but horticulture was a small part of it, but it's continuing to expand and grow. Um, here as a curator with the North Central Regional Plant Introduction Station, I curate almost 250 different genera. Yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, of crops that I work with, if you want to call them crops, um, but most of them are, are either herbaceous or woody plants. Um, and, and you're trying to collect the seeds off of those, and that can vary from a quick turnaround to a long-term project, correct? Um, if you look at some of the herbaceous plants that we work with, sometimes we can collect large quantities of seeds initially in nature, um, and we'll have enough to make those available, uh, back those up at our, our uh, backup facility in Fort Collins, uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes with trees, it's sometimes hard to collect those quantities of seeds. You know, physically accessing them might, might uh, not be possible unless you have the right tools or the right situation. And, Sometimes the timing just isn't there to collect those seeds. And sometimes the squirrels might get to them before you before, do, before right? Before we do, that's right. <laughs> so there's a lot that plays into this, but basically, let's summarize why you're doing this and the importance of it. Um, well, if you, if you think about uh, agronomic crops, it's always sometimes we're having to deal with a, a disease epidemic or, a, or an insect epidemic where it's wiping out or uh, controlling a particular monoculture of, uh, in the agronomy world. Uh, but with horticulture, sometimes it's just conserving that species. Um, a lot of our, uh, uh, our nature is being attacked because of insects or diseases, and sometimes it's because of management um, or because of invasive species have, have, have created a particular competitive event that makes those plants hard to withstand uh, nature. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a lot of crops that we're trying to introduce as far as new new plants in the nursery industry, or maybe it's particular uh, traits about those those plants that we're trying to see economically produced for their, say, perhaps their essential oils. So, so. so one plant that you're looking at um, is the ash tree, I know, because emerald ash borer is really causing a concern across the country. And so you're trying to preserve uh, just the the genetic diversity. And just because you've collected it in one area doesn't mean you've preserved that, right? Correct. I mean, as you know, if, if we have an ash tree and we collect seeds from something that's in Minnesota, uh, as opposed to collecting it in, say, Oklahoma, uh -huh. uh, if you were to plant a Minnesota-sourced ash in Oklahoma, it might not do too well. Right. Um, and vice versa, if you planted the Oklahoma source in Minnesota, you could have just the exact complications. So having all that genetic diversity helps sometimes figure out which one is best adapted to your area, or at least gives you all those genetic tools and you're not for the nursery trade. You're not collecting off of trees out of somebody's front yard that they've planted from a nursery from no. who knows where. You're looking for native populations? Correct, because those populations have been there for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. and they're adapted to that particular area. Okay. And so what really sets you guys apart from some other seed banks that we hear about um, you know, I mean, I know you're saving the seeds, but how do we know those seeds are going to last? Well, that's a very good point because that does separate us. And, and we do what's called regenerations or seed increases. Okay. Where we take a, a small sample of seeds that we may have gotten from someone or we've collected ourselves and we grow those out and then we control pollinate those using a, a variety of methods to control pollinate. And then we recollect those seeds off of those plants and basically supplying that seed jar, if you will, mm -hmm. back up to a, a good level. And you've got an example of a, a herbaceous here that you've collected right from Oklahoma, right? Yes, this is a, an example of Minarda russelliana, which, uh -huh. uh, which was collected um, in 2018, just about a year ago, uh, near Worcester Lake okay. in McCurtain County. 
And uh, this, this collection was made as an opportunistic collection where I was down in Texas working on a particular species called Minarda luteliola, mm -hmm. which is this beautiful buttery yellow flowered Minarda that has an amazing lemon scent to it. And so we made a number of collections of this Minarda luteliola, which is a, a relatively recently described species in 2011 uh -huh. and so we were wanting to conserve that by collecting seeds and also making that distributed for people that would want to utilize that in the, in the nursery industry. And when you talk about people utilizing it, who is it that is, is contacting you asking for the seed to, to use? It's, it's a variety of folks from, from, like I said, nursery people to people that are, are working in, in botanical gardens and arboretums that want to have a particular taxonomic entity represented in their collection. Mm -hmm. Or it may be someone that's looking at particular essential oils that are really high in a particular species or a, a genetic line uh, so that they can have that in their, in their production systems. Um, to people that are looking at archaeology, you know, wanting to say that, that this species was around so many years ago. So there's a wide variety of people that are, are so looking at using our materials. Usually research and development. A homeowner can't necessarily say, I'm looking oh, for that plant. Sorry, that's not going to happen. <laughs> okay, okay. Even though we like to see our, our particular species used, you know, it takes a lot of money and resources right. to keep these around. Yeah. And if we're distributing those out, you know, freely, um, it, you know, to anybody that wants it, um, eventually we, we're, we're going to exhaust the system. You know, we have to have some guidelines in place on who we distribute to. Right. And so uh, this Minarda is netted for a reason. You obviously yeah. don't want cross-pollination. Correct. Um, so the, the net here basically excludes pollen from coming in mm -hmm. and keeps the pollen that's within the cage there. So this Worcester Lake uh, collection of Minarda russeliana will always be that Worcester Lake population. Uh -huh. So if perhaps Worcester Lake's population Minarda russeliana is, is attacked or lost because of, of habitat destruction or, or you name it, yeah. um, they could request genetics back from us that are clearly adapted and, and have been from that area. Excellent. So, and you use you introduce pollinators into there if you use, need it on certain plants? We or? have a number of variety of pollinators that we use, um, including honeybees, bumblebees, uh, house flies, and, and uh, um, alfalfa leaf cutters. Okay. And depending on the flower morphology or maybe the temperatures uh, that the, the plants are experiencing at the time of flowering will determine which insect we use. Okay. They're a lot better at it than we are as humans <laughs> making controlled pollination. So we, we, we use them as, as much as we can. Absolutely. So we, we can see this Menard is in bloom. Can we take a look at what happens after you actually harvest the seed and go look and see where that seed's being stored? Let's go take a look. Excellent. Jeff, this is quite a collection of seeds you got here. Well, I can't say it's, it's all my collections. <laughs> Mine's a very small part, but if you look at uh, what we have here, uh, most of it's actually corn. Yeah, you've got a lot of, and it all looks so different. I mean, so this represents all different types of corn. Correct. I mean, you know, just looking at a particular example, you may not recognize what its value is right now, but it may be very valuable down the road. Yeah, yeah. As, as problems might arise, diseases, things like that. And I see pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds. I mean, it, it's a lot you have here. So this is the refrigerator that we're in. Correct. We have, we have two different uh, areas where we store our seeds. And this is kind of the working area where we have seeds stored at four degrees C. And that's the refrigerator conditions, typically for at home, your uh -huh. refrigerator. And these seeds will store for a fairly long period of time, but it, Every species is a little different on how well it stores or how well it doesn't. Um, and we also have a negative 18C uh, storage area, which is basically freezer conditions. Thanks for not taking me in there. <laughs> which extends out the, the longevity of those seeds, usually. Okay. Um, and those are the seeds that we put in the, in the freezer are kind of our original seeds, the, the first collection that we get of a particular accession. Okay. Um, and these are generally the seeds that we have available for distribution um, and are, are generally the increased seeds that we've obtained through our 
uh, increase through controlled pollination. Okay, so do you, so how many requests do you get for seeds every year? Um, well, we get lots of requests. Yeah. Sometimes we don't always honor those, um, but on average, at least recently over the last year or so, we've been distributing about 60 to 65,000 packets of seeds per year. And that's just out of this site here? That's out of just our site. Wow. And you know, our site here, uh, the North Central Regional Plant Introduction Station is part of a very large organization called the National Plant Germplasm System. Okay. And there's a lot of other gene banks that play into this game of seed saving, uh -huh. just like we do. It's just that they might maintain a very different group of taxa. Because it might be more environmentally appropriate in their location versus what you're growing here. Correct. Okay. Like Corn, as an example, in Iowa, we're in the corn belt. <laughs> makes Obviously, sense. it makes sense to grow corn and keep the collection here. Gotcha. Okay. So are there any plants that don't do well as far as saving seeds, and what do you do about that? Good question. Uh, because, you know, you think about emerald ash borer, we've been collecting a lot of seeds to save those genetics of, of ash across mm -hmm. the U.S. But imagine if we had a, an insect or a disease or problem with, say, oaks or hickories or uh -huh. walnuts or even magnolias. You know, those are species are that we call recalcitrant, meaning that they won't store under these types of conditions. Mm -hmm. So, God forbid we have a, a problem with those and we have to try to start saving those. How would we do that? Well, thankfully our folks at the National uh, Laboratory for Genetic Resources Preservation in Fort Collins, Colorado, has determined that we can actually harvest budwood or sticks in the wintertime and simply stick those in liquid nitrogen or cryopreservation. Okay. So that's a good and thing sure to have. And I'm sure there's a major process to that. It doesn't just Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like you can just yeah. dump them in the tank yeah. and they're good to go. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that, that's a concern, at least from our point of view, is that when you're collecting budwood, you're collecting genetics from one individual. As it's a, a clone, basically. It's like taking exactly. a, a cutting of it. Exactly. So we've talked about diversity in the landscape. Right. You know, in an urban forest, you know, we may have lots of maples, but what's the diversity there? They may be all from one clone. Okay. So as an example, if you look at a jar of seeds, you have all kinds of different genetic diversity that's in that sample. Because you don't when know you talk about, what was pollinated with it out in the yes, native areas. Especially okay. when we're collecting from native populations. We don't always know how many daddies are, are participating <laughs> in creating that seeds, but generally it's, it's quite a few. Yeah, so you've got more genetics there. And they're a lot easier to take care of in the jar than they are as a plant in the field. Okay, okay. But there is a way to preserve those as well. Correct. So that's valuable information. So we're looking through here and we're kind of getting into some more of the herbaceous uh, ornamental stuff. We've got spirea. Um, and it's fascinating to see your labels on here, where all this stuff, you've got some hollyhocks and just where they've all originated from. Um, the hollyhock collection is, is one that we've had for a very long time. Um, and I, I don't know exactly how many collections that we have, but some of these are actually breeders lines. Uh -huh. And some of these are actually wild collections. Um, or some of the crop wild relatives, as we might say, uh, for where hollyhocks originated. So if somebody wanted to try to recreate a new color or new uh, uh, particular line of Alcea, they could. So we'll know that there's a Monarda from Oklahoma in here eventually. Eventually, <laughs> once we collect the seeds off of that, that uh, plot in the greenhouse, um, those seeds will go into the jar here and may last for who knows how long. So how do you know how long it lasts? Let's get into like the, the germination rates and the viability. Is somebody taking care of that or testing it occasionally? Correct. We have a, a germination coordinator here that helps monitor those, those uh, seed samples. Okay. Um, just because they're, you know, we've kind of halted respiration and, and, and extending that longevity, they're not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. And so our coordinator, uh, Lisa Fifner, was actually tests the viability on these about every five to ten years, uh -huh. which is a huge job for one person. <laughs> He's got a lot of seeds <laughs> to go through. Um, and so once we figure out that those seeds, and she's notified me in particular that a particular line is starting to drop in, in germination, uh, we will pull that seed and repeat that whole process of growing them out in that controlled pollination environment to repopulate that jar. So you don't lose the, the genetic viability and stuff. Correct. Excellent. Well, Jeffrey, this has just been fascinating and thank you for sharing the story. And it's good to know that the USDA is saving those plant genetics for us. You're welcome.
hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.